on the screen with me today, I wish I could say in person in the studio, but on the screen with me today is Marilyn McSweeney and Sid Meadows. Marilyn, take it away. Let's have an introduction. I specialize in recruiting primarily in the commercial interiors industry. Um, I come from that industry, design, sales, sales leadership, and hiring uh, before I started this company 22 years ago. So I speak with hiring managers every day about what their ideal candidate looks like and why they chose who they chose out of the interviews and getting candidate feedback. And also on screen with us today is Sid Meadows. Thank you so much, Sid. Hey, um, Amy, Marilyn, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, my name is Sid Meadows and I'm a certified professional coach and a certified high performance coach. <clears throat> and very much like Marilyn, I've spent my entire career working in the contract interior space. And about three years ago, I pivoted away from my corporate job um, and started my own business. So I became an entrepreneur about three years ago. I own a coaching, consulting, and training company. And uh, we work with small to mid-sized businesses and individuals and really helping them craft their journey towards success. And I'm super passionate about people and helping people, and which is one of the reasons that I got involved to, with this initiative and some of the other things we've been doing as a company to support people who are going through career transition or career changes. Well, welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. And hello again to everyone. My name is Amy Bollier, and I have been spending my time for the last almost 15 years hate to date myself, but uh, last 15 years or so focusing on leadership development specifically and looking at how people can show up as their best self from a leadership perspective. Um, and of course, that includes the personal perspective. So I'll be bringing that expertise to the table today. So as a reminder, what you all signed up for, we are here to talk about if you are in a career rut, how to step up and stand out. And one theme that was very, very prevalent to us was this idea about feeling that ageism, age discrimination may happen to me. And the other theme that came up in the questions was about um, using Zoom or other online platforms to do video interviewing. So we want to touch on those two subjects first, since there seemed to be a, a big draw for that. What advice do you have for those <coughs> folks out there who are fearing the potential of an employer um, having an ageist attitude. You know, do the things that you can in the first um, um, run of the resume, if you will, to appear to be ageless. And what I mean by that is remove the year you graduated from high school or that you graduated from college from your resume. Just say that you got a degree from XYZ University rather than putting a date on it that says I graduated in 1975. That immediately dates you. So take that away and just say that you got the, got the degree. The other thing that I think is super important is to really focus on your accomplishments and what you accomplished at the results that led to that company. What were the results the company got it because of your accomplishments? And I think Marilyn's going to probably talk about that too, but you know, really focus on what you accomplished. And then honestly, I'm just going to tell you, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed that you're, you know, in your mid fifties and you're without a job, stand up and be proud of who you are, what you've done, and all the things that you've accomplished. And remember, what you're going through right now is not a want to, it's a have to. The companies that displaced you, whether it was a layoff or a furlough or, or job elimination or whatever it was, they did that because they have to. It was not that they wanted to. They are, just like a lot of other companies, in survival mode, so stand up and say, I am proud of what I've done. Yes, I am impacted because of a worldwide pandemic, but don't let it stop you from moving forward. And Marilyn, what are your thoughts? What could a person do to show their age is their advantage? Yeah, sure. And, you know, any company would deny that, that they do that, but I hear it practically every day when I speak with a client about what their ideal candidate looks like. So it, it is alive and well, and you need to be aware of that. The company can't ask you your age. 
um, and they really can't even ask you how much longer you're going or you're planning to work. So my recommendation would be to bring that into the conversation. It's not as important how old you are, but how many more years you have left to give. Honestly and passionately tell them that you, you're planning to work another seven to 10 years, or maybe it's five to seven years, and what you can expect to get from them during that time. I'll come in, I'll set up this division, I'll hire the right people, and then someone else can slide in and, and take it over. So be specific about what you'll do for them for what minimum amount of time. And, and I love what you just said about the, the growing of future talent behind you, right? Those mm -hmm. years of experience and that wisdom is what a company is clamoring for. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if as, as a wise older person and you can share that wisdom with the younger generations who are coming up behind you, that's that's exactly what the company wants you to be able to develop. I'll just also add here. Um, somebody's adding in the question. Thank you, Valdez. Um, what about dates of employment? So in Sid's comment about removing your years of education. When it comes to dates of employment, though, employers do want to see that. Absolutely. Here's the safety net though. Resumes should only reflect the past 10 years of your career. So even if your career started in 1975 when you graduated from college, you're not bringing your resume all the way back there. So in other words, your last 10 years is the same snapshot for anybody. I think it's important somewhere on your resume or in your cover letter or your cover email to the people that you're reaching out to, to let them know how you're staying up to date and current on the use of technology and what technology you know how to use, um, legislation that might be happening or industry trends, depending on the industry that you work on, that will also show them how much you are a student, if you will, of your industry and that you're on top of what's going on there. And I think that's as important as anything. Yep. Yeah, yeah, put that in your resume as well. That's always one of the biggest concerns is the, the lack of technology skills. Mm -hmm. So you know, don't lie about it, but put those on your, you know, your uh, technical proficiencies on your resume. And I have to say, you know, specifically coming from, you know, a, a niche industry that sometimes we do like to know what you did prior to 10 years. So what I've been seeing lately that I kind of like is the last 10 years with the dates and everything. And then under that, just say prior experience, you know, was a sales rep for X company, was a designer for that company. You're not putting the years, you're just putting a couple things to let them know that you have more than 10 years experience in that industry. If you're just putting your resume on a job board, I can see trying to maybe hide your age so that you can perhaps get that interview and, and have the opportunity to express your value proposition. You know, when they meet you, they're gonna find out how old you are anyway. So uh, sometimes I might say, don't necessarily try to hide that because they can Google it and find that information. Um, just really focus on the, the value that you're going to bring during the amount of time that you can commit to working. Nice. So moving us to the second big theme that showed up again, it was the video interviewing worries that people were having. And what I'd like to add on that subject is to show up as your best self. So in other words, you're going to present your best self. That means dress for the part as if you were in an in-person interview. And I like to say dress for the part and then some. <laughs> Do one better. Um, I also would highly recommend that you get yourself in a space of uninterrupted, undisturbed. So AKA silence your electronics. And that means everything. And if you're using your computer, that means shutting down all other programs except for the online platform that you'll be interviewed on. So if that's Zoom or if it's Skype or team, uh, Teams, it doesn't matter what it is, just make sure there are no other programs that could send you an alert or a notification pop up that would do two things. One, it might create a sound that you don't want the employer to hear. And two, it might create an, a mental distraction where you see the message and now you're flustered in the interview. So eliminate distractions. Get rid of all those distractions because remember, 
Your brain cannot multitask. Even though we think it can, your brain cannot multitask. If you live with a household of people, whether it's roommates, pets, <laughs> um, spouses, partners, whatnot, inform them the door is closed and that means I cannot have yelling or laughing or music booming outside this door. Let them know that you'll be unavailable during that time. The other re recommendation I've been seeing heavily touted these days is to hardwire your computer into your internet. That way you eliminate the chance of interrupted service or a disconnect from your Wi-Fi. The thing that I'm seeing the most that I would like to correct is not having your um, camera at eye level. And we're seeing an awful lot of shots up people's noses, <laughs> you know. Um, it, most of us hopefully are doing the ergonomically correct thing and having like a sit to stand workstation. But if you don't have that, just put your computer on a stack of books. Be looking at the camera and not having it shot from from up here. Yeah. Right. And be, be conscious of what's in your background. I've seen some kind of interest. Like it's okay to have a family photo and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, something like that. But I've also seen uh, very <laughs> messy situations. What I would tell you is change the backdrop, pivot like to where you're against a plain back, a, a plain wall, or maybe there's a picture just behind you. So in other words, I, what we're getting at here, our advice is to, to keep it a simple backdrop, as simple as you can, so mm -hmm. that people can focus on you and not be trying to get to know you through the clutter behind you. <laughs> but I, I do think you if, you have, if you have the blank wall option in the bedroom to turn it I, I, if that's an option, I highly recommend Sid's advice. Yeah. <laughs> you need to treat this exactly like it is a face-to-face -face interview. Do your homework, do your research, be prepared, come with questions that you want to ask about the position, do questions that you want to ask about the company. I mean, you need to, also you need to know the technology. If you've never used Google Hangout and that's how they're going to interview you, you need to go learn the technology, get a friend to help you test that technology. You know, be sure you've got something to take notes on. When you're there and when you're live with them on camera, don't talk about how much you hate being on camera because guess what? You're on camera. The world today is right now about video conferencing of some sort. So don't talk about the fact you don't like being on camera sure that you can come across with good audio quality and then check your lighting. Check the lighting, see how you look, get with a friend, ask them to check the lighting so that, because you want to be able to be seen, you don't want to be just like totally blacked out or have a huge shadow behind you or bright light behind you. So, you know, make sure that you test some of this stuff before you step up into that first Zoom or Teams or Hangout, whatever it is, interview with them. Because this is your opportunity to put your best foot forward. It just happens to be on video. So I'm going to address some of the um, questions that have been coming in through the Q&A version. This person was asking about having a set of responsibilities in the first 15 years of their career, but not such high level responsibilities in the later 10 years. I think Marilyn's answer speaks to that, where you just do the additional talents and skills section that she's suggesting, where it outlines additional responsibilities that you've been able to manage successfully. And another question that came in, how do employ employers feel about someone who's kept the same, um, excuse me, worked for the same company over the last 10 years? Is that seen as somebody being loyal or is that showing a biased experience? Some people look at that as terrific, you're loyal, and they're going to want to see your growth in that time. That's the bottom line. Can you show your growth? What have you learned? What additional responsibilities within that same company have you had? Have you had promotions, certifications, any education? Any of these things that you've been able to achieve in those 10 years is going to be critical to put on the resume. Just like Amy said, it's what you did in that 10 years. So if you were promoted, make sure that that's in bold on your resume and it pops out. Everybody's wanting to see progression, whether it's with different companies or with one. And talk about yeah. the things that you've done and the accomplishments that you had at that organization. You stayed for 10 years. Be sure they understand why 
they know that you stayed for 10 years and how your career progressed. So this person said, I haven't job hunted or interviewed in several years. I've opened my LinkedIn profile to show all, not just recruiters, but to show all that I'm actually looking. I'm on Indeed, I'm on Monster. I even had my resume redone. I've posted that on job boards, several of them. I've reached out to a few recruiters and even several executives that I used to work with and had great rapport. Am I covering all the ground that I need to? In a time like this where there's not as much hiring, take a more strategic approach to just applying online because everybody's applying online. And even when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, the research says that only three to 5% of jobs are found online anyway. So don't spend more than three to 5% of your time applying online because you're just, you're likely to not get a lot of responses and it feeds the kind of the fear and depression that a lot of people are going through right now. Start yeah. connecting with the people. And it starts with understanding who do I want to connect with? And understanding, it, honestly, it's about being intentional. Be intentional about who you're connecting with and what it is that you're looking for, or what it is that you need. And stop networking and start connecting. Networking um, just kind of insinuates that you're going to a function in a hotel lobby and trying to get as many business cards or, you know, electronic cards as you can, um, but more about building real relationships. So I call it a power circle of five to 10 people that are in the most, you know, professional positions to be able to help you as possible. Building the right relationships and then being your best self when you do show up. Amy, I think it was you earlier that said showing up as your best self. Um, take some of this time to work on self-improvement and your personal brand. If you can afford it, um, you know, get a career coach and um, make sure that you're able to articulate very quickly in an elevator speech kind of what your personal brand is and, and what people can expect from you. What other ideas do you suggest? Research, perhaps pivoting careers, uh, doing a lot of informational interviews. Um, I, I always say that these relationships are like a bank account. You know, you can't make a withdrawal before you make a deposit. So as you're trying to solidify, better solidify those relationships with your power circle, make sure that you're conscious of giving back in the way of ideas and introductions. So to simplify what you've just said, the strategy really becomes strong connections with fewer yes. sources rather than blanketing all the sources. Absolutely. That's what I've seen work year over year that I've been doing this. Yeah. Sid, what are your thoughts on that? Make LinkedIn your new best friend. Somebody asked the question, was LinkedIn important? Absolutely. It is through the roof important. LinkedIn at the end of the day is a search engine. Use it that way. Search for keywords that are important to you. People will come up. Look for, if you want to be a lawyer and you've got a law degree in some very specific that you work with small businesses, type in lawyer, small business and see what comes up. Right. And there are all these buttons that you want to look at people, content or jobs, but you have to get engaged in that conversation. And remember, you're making a new connection. And if you make a new connection and you reach out to them on LinkedIn, you better send them a note as to why you're reaching out to them. Why do you want to connect with them? Don't just send a blind connection request. Tell them why. That goes for any day of the year. Thank Nobody you. wants the generic LinkedIn connection that yeah. everybody has seen. Ooh. It's the why that matters. Absolutely. And listen, right. I reply to every person that I connect with. Mm -hmm. Every yeah, person that, that I connect with, I reply to and say, it's nice to meet you. What brought you to my profile? How can I support you? I had the CEO of a multi-million dollar company send me a LinkedIn request with no note. Well, I saw who he was and you better believe I jumped on the opportunity to build a connection with that guy. And I sent him a note. He responded. We had a nice little chat on LinkedIn. Now I have a new connection.
I, yeah. I engaged in the conversation with yeah. him rather than waiting on him to engage with me. So another question about LinkedIn has popped up and that question is the person's LinkedIn profile is very heavily linked to the current employer. So I'm interpreting that as um, what I've seen is employers ask of their employees to put out this piece of communication, put out this banner behind your head, you know, all of those things that employers want their employees to do to tout the company. Mm -hmm. So the person asks, because their LinkedIn profile right now is so linked to their current company, how much should this be updated and desensitized before I start my job seeking? It doesn't matter. Because here's the thing, a hiring manager is not going to go and scroll through all of your posts or likes and look to see that you, that you, everything you did is with this company, this company, this, they're not going to do that, right? The first thing they're going to do when they go to your profile is look at your profile, look at your image, look at your experience, they're gonna scroll down and they're going to look at what you've done. Yes. That's where you need to focus. That part needs to be filled out. Second thing, if it is full of ABC company, Go create your own content, put a post out there, comment on other people's posts because yeah. that moves it up, right? Write an article, write a blog, publish it, you know, change what your features are on there that people highlight, change that. And that's what they're going to see. The more content you create, especially once you're connected with them, the more visibility that you're going to have as an industry, someone that's knowledgeable of a certain industry or an expert in a certain category. Marilyn? Yeah, I absolutely agree. So I'm taking that question as they're currently employed, you know, yep. with that company. And how do you message, you know, that you're in an active job search? Well, you know, you can click that recruiters only can see that, that you're looking. But under prior COVID situations, you are more attractive to a potential company if you are employed than if you're not. Now. Obviously, that has changed in the last couple of months. There's amazing people that are on the job market through no fault of their own. Recruiters are going to reach out to you if you have an impressive profile, whether you're employed or not. But if you're not employed, I would recommend that you end that date on your LinkedIn profile because I've had a couple of situations where, and, and trust me, these potential employers are looking at your LinkedIn profiles and they felt like it was intentionally misleading, you know, that they were still employed when, when you weren't. So keep it updated. And if you, you know, your employment did end because of COVID, go ahead and put that on there. But then that, then you can um, publicly post that you're mm -hmm. in a job search and that yes. helps you even more. How will companies approach clients now, uh, clients, applicants now, what will they be looking for? and doing differently in their searches for candidates? Well, we saw this coming out of the recession that companies were being more cautious yep. about their hiring and adding additional layers and steps. Yep. So they're first going to try to fill the position by networking with, with who they know, but then you know LinkedIn is the next best thing. They're going to be looking on LinkedIn, but I just, I, I think they're going to be more diligent about asking around about you, um, asking for referrals. Um, they're going to just expect you to be more patient as they go through a longer interview process and they take additional steps. Yeah, Maybe I'm seeing they that added too. layers of assessments and, um, you know, reference checking and things that they hadn't really done in the past. So I guess my best advice is just to be patient and go along with, you know, ask that question up front, what will the interview process look like? And um, <laughs> yeah, because their approach is very different. I think partially because not everybody's working the same hours that they used to. So even yeah. getting the right players to be interviewing the candidate, yeah. that's much harder coordination these days versus being in the office. The other thing I'll add to what you've said is, I believe companies are going to be much more keenly looking at um, what's your resilience to adapting to change? 
Um, and employers are going to want to hear those stories. How did you get through COVID? But even beyond that, how did you handle rapid change and welcome to unwanted change at any point in your career? Sid, do you want to add anything to that question about uh, what, what you know, their approach is to candidates? First off, they're going to be looking at your mindset and yeah. how, um, how you're doing. And what I mean by that is, what is your mindset? Are you someone who's come to the interview or to the conversation as being down and depressed and mopey? Or are you someone that's coming in that is going to have a, be upbeat and energetic and excited? Listen, as I said in the beginning, this happened to you, okay? And it was not a ha it was not a want to, it was a have to. And how you respond to this is so important. And I know that it can be tough to go out there and find the joy in the situation or find joy right now or be grateful for things, but joy and gratitude are going to change your mindset and you need to focus on changing your mindset right now. The next thing I'm going to tell you is um, they're going to want to know what you did. What have you been doing? So have you been binge watching Netflix? Have you watched every episode of Tiger King? If you have, please don't tell them that. In fact, don't even bring up Netflix. Don't ask about, have you seen Tiger King, right? They want to know what you've been doing. So this is a prime opportunity for you as an individual to invest in yourself. Invest in your growth and in your development. Read a book, listen to a podcast, you know, take an online course. There's tons of free ones out there. What are you doing to invest in yourself and be sure you're sharing it with them of the things that you've been doing to do a better job? Because people are going to want to talk to people that are still going. Coming out of this, you are going to get asked what you did during this time. And I would maybe perhaps recommend that you especially focus on emotional intelligence um, even before COVID, that's one of the main reasons that somebody will get hired over another, especially using a recruiter. We've already screened them that they have the resume and, and the background and the experience that you need. But as we speak with these hiring managers, why did you choose who you did? A lot of times it comes down to chemistry and emotional intelligence. And if you're not real familiar with what that is, there's uh, a lot of sources. I mean, I would say use some of this time to become a topic matter expert on job search and on building relationships and on increasing your emotional intelligence. So two other, uh, what I think are quick questions. One, the question is, do or do not put a picture on the resume? My simple answer to that is, I think it's a starting point of building your connection. We are visual beings who make connections with our, with our site. So if they get a familiarity from your smile or they get a sense of warmth from the twinkle in your eye, great. Um, again, what we've been saying this whole time is keep it professional. I don't recommend outdoor shots. I don't, I don't recommend the power shot. You know, it's something that makes you approachable that they're going to want to connect with. Mm -hmm. So something that shows the, the who you are that's unique to you. I'm not a big fan of having a photo on a resume. Um, part of the reason is I want to drive them to LinkedIn. And, and everybody's using it these days. You know, you get a resume, you immediately look them up on LinkedIn, and that helps drive viewership where your LinkedIn profile is even more impressive than, than your resume resume. You have those interactive links on there and things that perhaps you've published or, or whatever that Sid was speaking to. So I'm all about driving it to, to the LinkedIn profile. Um, but it also takes up real estate space on, I mean, you really yeah. shouldn't go over two pages on your resume and, and that photo was taking up some real estate that, you know, might affect your, your format. I don't know. What do you think? We can help with the formatting. So it's not, but I, I hear you completely and it shouldn't be an eight by 10, right? The, the page is eight <laughs> by 11. So we're talking about something little next to the address, the yeah. contact info and such. So I'm going to agree. I actually agree with both of you. Um, okay. I don't mind a picture on the resume, but I also think it takes up real estate. If you're going to put one out there, make sure it's a good, it's a good one. quality photo 
please do not yeah, take a selfie. Lady. Don't have a hat on or sunglasses on. You know, this is a professional environment. It should be professional. If you don't have the resources to have a headshot made, and every Apple phone or Android device have high quality cameras on them, and you can take portrait modes, and you can get some really good headshots with just your phone. So use that said something in a previous discussion that she and I were having that is just literally stuck with me and I tell everybody about it. when <laughs> your resume gets to Marilyn's desk you have five to six seconds to grab her attention and stand out is that that's pretty much what you said right Marilyn yeah we have um, actually on our website and on, on our LinkedIn page, we have a couple of other pre-recorded webinars that go into more depth of some of the things we're lightly touching on here. Yeah. But, and, and I didn't steal this from anybody. This is my own experience that it's not going to be your resume that gets you the job, but it can prevent you from getting the interview. Mm -hmm. If it's a bad one or you have a bad photo on there or, you know, so you definitely need to have all of those pieces great but that's also researched that your resume gets about five six second glance before we decide to delete it or keep reading so mm -hmm. the format has to be easy to read and you need to really bullet point your most specific measurable accomplishments because that's what the reader is looking for and if they're buried in a giant paragraph it's hard to find so bullet point those then you've got my attention and I'm going to keep reading. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're, you're leading us right into the next category of questions that people were most concerned with. And of course, it's the title of our webinar. So how does somebody make their resume stand out? If it's not adding a photo to make it unique, if it's, what is it? Is it color? Is it fonts? Is it, what, what is it that can make them stand out? Um, and, and in addition to that, uh, the other question, part of that question that came in was, what skills should I be developing while I'm out of work to increase my marketability? Um, and what about not just my resume standing out, but myself, so my personal brand and my own marketability? So all of that is fair game for this subject <laughs> area. So kind of echoing what I said a few minutes ago, investing in yourself is critical. It is of the utmost importance right now. And it's not just for now, but it's also for your future success and showing growth in a time period when you weren't working or you didn't have the opportunity to be promoted or things like that. Show growth. And I think the skill question is something you have to answer. You've got to take inventory of your skills and you've got to look at what are the current things that I'm good at? Where am I weak? and then go invest in developing the weak skills. I mean, for example, LinkedIn Learning has all types of courses that you can take, and depending on your membership level at LinkedIn, they're free. Because you gotta have an honest conversation with yourself about what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. And I would highly encourage you to ask a friend or two, maybe a former coworker or maybe a former boss, hey, Amy, couple of things that I think you could work on were this because it's all about helping you get better. Then go invest in honing those skills or bettering those skills. I would add to the standout content is doing things that show that you're yeah. taking time and not just being on autopilot or on automated services. And what I mean by that is, should you get the interview, write a handwritten note to say thank you that will make you stand out. I know it takes three to four days in the mail, but that's the one service I would say has gotten better in COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> My mail is coming faster than ever. Um, but that, that said, um, you know, do the thing that makes you stand out from other people with a connection. So it goes back to, um, I think, authenticity. The other idea is if you maybe in the conversation or even based on what they've posted on LinkedIn, write an uh, sorry, send an article that relates to that topic mm -hmm. so that you and he or you and she can talk about that article. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you get your conversation started even before the interview possibly. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just believe those unique touches that are personalized <coughs> are what difference in creating, creating an experience they can expect if they were working with you.
Mm -hmm. The theme of questions that people were submitting around the idea of changing industries, changing roles, and some of those included going from a profit company to a nonprofit, moving from self-employed to corporate, uh, changing fields, and the question becomes, how do I find another mm -hmm industry and how do you make that pivot happen folks? some people are going to be forced to pivot careers because at least until we're well out of covid which yes. could be you know quite some time i think for one thing you've got to do a tremendous amount of research yep. into that industry so that you can kind of become a topic matter specialist and then it comes down to building relationships with people in mm -hmm. that industry even if they're just you know, the receptionist or a salesperson there and they're not in a hiring capacity, they yep. can at least help you do the research and get an introduction to, mm -hmm. to the hiring manager. So focus on that, but then be able to clearly articulate your transferable skills. Mm -hmm. So if you've done enough research, you know what some of the skills are that they're looking for. And if it requires an additional certification or two, this is a great time to be doing that. Um, so really focus on the transferable skills and your value proposition message of what they're going to get if they hire you. And then I guess um, lastly would be have examples of how you have handled situations like that in the past, how you have pivoted something or really overcome a, you know, a big um, you know, change to what you were expecting, be able to articulate how you navigated through that change. And that somewhat comes down to the emotional intelligence thing again. So, Sid, Sid, last thoughts on uh, the theme of pivoting yeah. careers or industries? It all starts with you. It all starts with your vision of what you want your career to be and where you want to go. And this is where you got to do the tough work, right? You can't just say, oh, well, I sold furniture today and tomorrow I'm going to go sell pharmaceuticals. It's not going to work that way. You need to really sit down and think about what are you passionate about? What, what, are you, what, what, what did you do or have you been doing for the last few years? And what about that are you passionate about? You got to do some exploring here about what you really enjoy and then look at what industry that correlates to. If you do go pick an industry, go do the research about the type of people that work, the type of jobs that are potentially are available there. I mean, you're going to have to really do some research. So if you do want to switch to pharmaceuticals, then talk to people that currently work in that, right? And look at what their skills are that they require for people or just read the job postings about the skills that they're looking for. Which ones do you have? Which ones overlap? Which ones are transferable, as Marilyn said? Which ones do you need to enhance? So it's, it's really about taking this time, especially if there's extra time on your hands without right. assigned mm -hmm. work, use this time to reflect on who you are and what's important to you. And that's what's gonna show up and make you stand out. Absolutely. The person who came in with, I took a step back from my job in industry long before COVID-19 was around. I'm going to go from one industry to another. How do I work through this change now in everything as it was already difficult? It was already a difficult climate for my changing career path. How do I make myself more approachable for a position now? Yeah, let's tackle that one. You know, if you've been working on this self-improvement uh, during this time, you know, to reflect what Sid said earlier, it's, I think it's so much about your countenance. I'm sure talking to a lot of angry people right now. Mm -hmm. And if that shows up in an interview, you're unlikely to move forward. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it's attitude, gratitude, um, you know, looking for the silver lining, just being a person that people want to be around. You know, I mean, the, I mentioned earlier that you get hired on chemistry. Nobody wants a Debbie Downer in, in their <laughs> office, you it's know, true. so yeah, just true. whatever it's going to take to get you there if you're not there already. So this particular question had to do from specifically to go from being a service provider to a salesperson mm -hmm. and being a support function to a salesperson. And what my recommendation to you would be is to really zone in on your sales skills, because let's be clear. Right now, looking for a job is a sales job. You are selling yourself. So really hone in on some of your sales skills. What skills do you need? And go out and get those skills.
is what I would recommend. Start contributing on conversations mm -hmm. about that field of work or about that mm -hmm. line of, uh, of work so that you start being seen within the community. Correct. And then it's like, oh, you know, Sid put out a really good comment the other day on this. Hmm, who's this guy? Mm -hmm. And they start digging into who you are as you contribute and gain popularity, if you will, within the community conversations. LinkedIn also has the groups feature, which allows you to enter into groups with permission requests, of course, but enter into groups within various industries. So as a coach, I can be within all the coaches. There's HR groups that I'm a member of. There's uh, training groups. So everything that's related to my leadership development world, I'm, I'm uh, tackling those groups to make sure that my connections stay strong and viable. And that's the recommendation here is tackle those groups that you might not have already been a part of. That would be a suggestion to tackle. I that's also, especially relevant if you're pivoting careers. Mm -hmm. You know, Every because like, you know, Sid and I have been in a specific industry where you know everybody knows everybody, and it's ancestral to some extent. But if you're <laughs> trans, <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. if you're transitioning into, we used the example earlier about pharmaceuticals. Nobody's going to know you there, so mm -hmm. you're going to have to get in groups and and utilize social media and yeah. so forth and and mm -hmm. if you don't feel that you have something to contribute in that group ask questions and people will start to see um yeah they'll start to notice you that's great so not only contribute topics and comments and ideas but ask questions of those people who already have the expertise another thing that i think is uh critical here is making those connections really genuine based on what awards or certifications you're seeing those people achieve so any awards that the company has earned or the individual is you know, boasting about, those are moments to connect with those places and, and cheer them on. So again, your name gets seen and says, oh, who, who's this Amy looking at us and, and touting this? I'll add to that, Amy, the thing about LinkedIn groups or LinkedIn is they're not going to be effective for you if you're a ghost. Just scrolling and occasionally hitting a like button is not going to help you. You're going to have to be engaged in the conversation. That's so you're right. only going to get what get out of something what you put into it. That's right. So one other question that's come up on, on the chat box, and I think that will be our finale. Is there a template of how to write a message on your LinkedIn profile that lets recruiters know that you're laid off and available? There is a button to unlock that allows your posting, your updates to be public. And that allows anybody in your network to see that you're available or not available. We're going to notice you more if you pick up the phone and call us or you do an active mm -hmm. uh, reach out. So who stands out as somebody who got a reference from someone that I respect or trust? Mm -hmm. Link relationships mm -hmm. with, with everything that you do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'll, I'll uh, echo what both of you said. And I just want to remind everybody, come in with a positive attitude. I go back to that mindset thing. Come in with a positive attitude. Do the work. Invest in yourself. And you're going to get through this. And don't let anything be off the table. Consider all different options for you. If you want to consider opening your own business, go explore that. I talked to a guy who didn't have a job, but he had opportunities. And this is about creating opportunities having the right mindset, being joyful and grateful for what you do have and where you're headed. Because guys, this is an amazing opportunity for you to go out in the world and do something even bigger and better yeah. than what you have been doing. So what is the best way to answer the question of who are you? Tell me about yourself if you've got 15 years or more experience. And I'll take a stab at that one. My thoughts on this are you've got to be succinct. It doesn't matter if you have one year experience or 21 years experience, the, the purpose of that question is you want to make sure you are articulating who you are that makes you the best candidate for that job. Mm -hmm. So it should be, you know, the 30 second elevator pitch that says, who am I? I'm the professional who has this skill, that skill, this attitude, this mindset, mm -hmm. this certification, and I'm here mm -hmm. to work hard. 
it's that kind of approach that mm -hmm. you want to do. So again, it's not mm -hmm. about recapping 15 years mm -hmm. minute by minute. It's <clears throat> really the, the moment that they're offering you to share what you want to share, like an essay question back in school. There's mm -hmm. no multiple choice. There's no one mm -hmm. right answer. They want a flavor for who you believe you are. I don't think I could have said it better. I would just echo everything that, mm -hmm. that Amy has said. I'm going to tell you to ditch the pitch, ditch the pitch and tell a story, yeah. tell them a story for 45 seconds about what you've been doing, include an accomplishment. So let me just give you an example for a second. So if somebody, you know, a few years ago would have asked me what, what is it that you do? Because I've been in the office furniture business my entire career. I would have said something like, well, I sell office furniture. Okay. That's great. They just sit there. <laughs> but what if you answered the question with, you know what, what I do is help companies improve employee engagement and workplace and satisfaction of their employees by helping them create dynamic workspaces for their company to thrive. Mm -hmm. Says exactly the same thing, but a lot differently. And the second one is going to get people having a conversation. Well, what, whoa, 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 what do you mean you help increase employee engagement? How, what does that look like? Yeah. It's a lot different in the conversation than, oh, I saw office furniture. And, you know, I think that is your elevator. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can afford it and you can invest in having a career coach that can help you with your personal branding, that is what they should be helping you mm -hmm. with. Yeah. Is that elevator speech and that personal brand <clears throat> is pretty much just, just like you uh, said. The second question is about sending unsolicited resumes. And I think Marilyn's last answer speaks to that. Make a connection with somebody. If you can seek out who the hiring manager is for that position you're interested in, rather than just the generic inbox they're asking you to send the resumes to, do some, do some diligent uh, investigative work and mm -hmm. see if you can get closer to the source. So I'm going to take us real quick back to a question that came in. Marilyn, there was a comment that you said about three to five percent of jobs are found via online vehicles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this person's asking, is that specific to the COVID-19 pandemic phase or is that always the case? It's, it's always the okay. case. Okay, yeah. great. Thank yeah. you. So for um, clarification, Marilyn, can I ask a follow-up question? What you said was three to five percent of jobs are actually found and filled through online job boards. You know, I check those statistics regularly. I have mm -hmm. for 22 years and it, it does continue to vary mm -hmm. right around that amount. We do appreciate all of your contributions and participation today. It's been a blast actually. Mm -hmm. So thank you Sid and Marilyn for making this fun and informative and hopefully eye-opening to folks. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.